doing business in Africa. You can't afford to be without Africa Investor. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Gracious me, that was a, a laudable uh, introduction. Um, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to this uh, Global Grids uh, session on unlocking Africa's uh, renewable uh, future. Um, as our colleague mentioned, my name is Dr. Hubert Danso. I am the Chairman and CEO of Africa Investor, as well as the CFA uh, New York's uh, Global uh, Asset Owners Council, and it's my privilege to uh, chair this particular uh, session. Um, I think, as we know, despite the grid infrastructure market being fraught with some kind of perception of it being complex and underinvested in, it does represent a massive, a massive investment opportunity to the order of about $21 trillion um, by 2050. That's the sort of scale and size of the opportunity. But that really still leaves the continent lacking in some respects. Um, because the continent typically receives its funding for this type of infrastructure that's either catalyzed or provided by public sources or multilateral development banks. So I think here in this session, we're really going to be trying to figure out with you and, and with our esteemed colleagues on the panel who I'll introduce, how do we really transform the perception and the reality of investing in African grid infrastructure uh, into a globally competitive investable uh, asset uh, class? And I've talked about 21 trillion globally, but you know SMI's stock take research uh, shows that African grid uh, investments stand at a mere 12 billion a year, and they really need to be quadrupled uh, to the order of about 50 billion uh, each year by uh, 2030. Excuse me, 20, yes, 2030 indeed. But where renewable energy investment has skyrocketed, which one would expect with all of the endowment and the assets that we have. The, the, the sort of the grid investment itself has remained very static at about 300 billion. And I think the order of magnitude again, that would need to increase to about 600 billion by 2030 to meet our own uh, stated uh, climate targets. So we all know that this good old saying that, you know, underinvestment in grids um, are potentially, as far as we see it on the continent, the biggest barrier to scaling African renewables uh, from an investment standpoint, also green industrialization and global decarbonization. So if you put it another way, um, we are simply saying there will be no energy transition um, without bankable transmission. And that's really why we are here um, you know, at COP to demonstrate and show some real leadership and some collective action. So this session is really going to address how the private sector and SMI can take that collective action with your good um, support to build momentum to spearhead and scale grid project investments and make transmission projects uh, more bankable. And as we just said, the, the, the ultimate aim is to ensure that we can characterize it and ultimately see it perform as a globally uh, competitive investable asset class. So we're going to be discussing a number of these issues, the challenges and the opportunities in financing African uh, grid uh, projects, how the private sector and governments and MDBs can better collaborate. We'll be discussing the use of innovative financial tools such as independent power transmission models, blended finance, institutional investor public partnerships, and we'll also be looking at the advances uh, in grid technology and how digitization uh, can be used to guide and underpin uh, investment uh, decision making. And to take us through um, this particular agenda and provide these insights and recommendations primarily for the COP presidency, uh, hopefully to take forward with uh, SMI, uh, with the support of SMI. Um, we've assembled this uh, impressive array of um, investment leaders who work extensively um, in the area and on uh, the continent. So let me just quickly run through who you have. You have uh, uh, Ms. Ije Okeke, who is the managing director of uh, Rocky Mountain Institute. I'm only pausing because I'm not hearing a clap. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we have Mr. Sharif Lekoli, who is the partner and head of the Middle East and North Africa at Actis. We have uh, Mr. Chris uh, Flavin, who is the uh, managing um, director at uh, Gridworks. We have Greg Jackson, who is the CEO of Octopus Energy. And we have um, Nadja Hakkasen, who is the Africa Senior Vice President for uh, Siemens uh, Energy. Well, thank you for your participation so early on. Um, so, so I'm now going to call on uh, my dear friend and colleague, um, Ije, to come and give some opening keynote remarks. And then following that, we'll enter into our panel discussion. Thank you.
Thank you, Herbert. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> We're um, related. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just want to talk uh, a little bit about uh, a couple of things, just to provide context on why we believe a central grid infrastructure is very critical and complementary to the energy transition. Uh, I also want to talk about the report that RMI, Octopus Energy, and the Sustainable Markets Initiative uh, is launching today. And I also want to talk about the work mm -hmm. that RMI is doing um, across the region in Sub-Saharan Africa to address uh, the grid infrastructure deficit. Across Africa, over 600 million people today still do not have access to reliable and affordable electricity. Achieving universal energy access will require using a mix of technologies that are available to us, both the central grid system and distributed renewable energy systems. We believe that using an integrated distribution model is essential um, to really addressing energy poverty in the region. In some cases, the least cost and fastest way to improve energy access is through grid extension. In other cases, you may need to work with decentralized mini-grids. And further along the value chain, you may also need to look at solar home systems. Luckily, we have this myriad of resources available to us to address the energy poverty issues in the region. There is no single solution, um, as I mentioned, and today, a lot of these technologies can be used in a very complementary manner in addressing the challenges that we have before us. Mini-grids are already providing over 27 million people in Africa with energy access. And that is more than any other continent uh, in the world. Oftentimes, because of the um, energy access deficit we have, with only 40, roughly 40% of Africans having access to energy, it gives us this opportunity to use different models to address these challenges. Solar home systems on the continent provide 45 million citizens with, with energy access. And this is just a demonstration of how we can use different methodologies to reach communities. Despite all of that, over 40% of the improvement in energy access is still expected to come from the central grid systems across um, Africa. And in appreciation of this reality at RMI, our program uses that dual strategy, where we're working closely with utilities and implementing uh, what we're calling the global utility innovation system to help digitize utilities, reform utilities, and catalyze investments into utilities. The other um, aspect of our strategy is supporting decentralized renewable energy systems and looking at ways of de-risking those systems and having them work very closely with utilities so that they can be deployed not in a competitive manner, but in a very complementary manner. Now, coming back to the utilities, um, several years of underinvestment in our grid system has led to poor reliability, inefficient operation, and high technical and commercial losses. Um, in Nigeria, where I ran um, a utility for, for five years, we had technical losses at the time we acquired the utility of 60%. And even after five years, we were able to bring it down significantly, but it was still uh, fairly high at uh, roughly 40% aggregate technical and commercial losses. So for every dollar of electricity that is channeled into that grid system, 60% uh, of it gets, 40% uh, of it gets lost. Um, to transform uh, these grids, I think we, we need a combination of investment and innovative thinking. This is a major opportunity to really invest in the grids to help us secure a clean and prosperous energy system. Uh, to unlock these opportunities, investments must be scaled rapidly. 
harnessing new financing structures, innovative business models, and making best use of advanced technologies um, to make grids more efficient. But the most important thing that we must do as we look at transforming our grids is invest in Africa's most abundant resource, and that is its people. This report that we are launching today, co-authored by Rocky Mountain Institute, RMI, and Octopus Energy, through the support from the Sustainable Market Initiative, examines the challenges impacting grids on the continent and sheds light on the actions needed to overcome these challenges to achieve a more sustainable energy system on the continent. Uh, in putting together this report, we drew on interviews with over 50 organizations from Africa and the rest of the world. And we held two workshops with global experts, and this report synthesizes our findings and extracts recommended actions that can make the most positive impact. The report focuses on two themes, money and models. The money section explores the pivotal role that the public sector and the MDBs, development finance institutions, have played in grid development to date. It also looks at the investment gap that we still have. Hubert mentioned the amount of the quantum of capital needed to transform these grids. And we look at this investment gap and, 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 it, and the important role that the private sector has to play in developing the grid. It is up to us to look at innovative structures that can combine different pools of capital outside of public sector, which has been historically the main source of capital for grids. We look at ways of combining philanthropic, public, and private sector capital to help catalyze investments into the grid. The model section takes stock of the opportunities arising from the skill potential on the continent, the innovation in data and digital technologies, and smart grids. Africa's population is the youngest in the world, and by engaging local communities, providing skills and training, and local green economies can, local green economies can be fostered, unleashing a new wave of, of sustainable growth. The launch of this report today at COP28 represents a pivotal opportunity for advancing actionable strategies that have the potential to propel Africa towards a sustainable energy future. Now is a time for action so we can truly accelerate the shift towards a cleaner, cheaper, and more resilient energy system for all. I look forward to continuing this discussion during the panel with my colleagues. Thank you all for your time. Testing. Oh, wonderful. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, AJ, for, for, really setting this, for really setting the scene. And, um, of course, we're investing in and, and, and uh, developing uh, this report. And I'm hoping that uh, um, there will be information from the good organizers to, to be able to make it available to, to, to anyone who would absolutely find it uh, uh, valuable. So we're going to jump straight into uh, this discussion, um, uh, which is really posited around some of the key elements of the report that uh, AJ just uh, introduced. So I'm going to, in the interest of time, just start with uh, Sharif. And again, I I'd like us to cast our minds into this space where we're beginning to think about investability, opportunities for private investment to participate in this and, and understand how grid infrastructure as an asset class in Africa could perform within an institutional portfolio. Because I think far too often, we think we're talking about investment by simply just adding up these massive numbers and saying that's what we need, without understanding that there's a, it's a complex and competitive world when we're, when we're seeking to crowd in uh, this type of capital, when we need to do it at this scale, and we need to do it in a geography um, that, 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 that is misunderstood in some respects. Um, so, Sharif, I just want to, you know, there were some bold and ambitious targets um, that I'm sure are in the report, and I know that EJ alluded to. Um, what we, we were targeting about 100% um, electricity access uh, across Africa by 2030. So, of course, that investment is just going to need to skyrocket. I mean, just to be uh, uh, undramatic about it. 
So my question to you is, what role do you see the private sector playing in financing renewable energy uh, uh, projects in Africa? And I always encourage as well, we, we don't just sort of always rely on this word financing because it's very <coughs> MDB-like. Um, and I think we're trying to transition from a public sector um, shallow pool of capital to long-term institutional pools of capital um, that can actually represent in a genuine way scale. Um, so that's the first part of the question. And the second is that, as you know, we've just got this super abundant natural capital and solar, uh, solar assets. So how do you see uh, uh, African nations transforming uh, our economies uh, to take advantage of this? And, and, and where do you see the opportunities uh, for the private sector uh, slash institutional investors? Um, over to you, Sharif. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for having me. And uh, I think this is a great topic. So I would take a step back and say that investing in renewables in Africa works. It works because we've done it for a very long time. We uh, have done it for uh, um, long before it became fashionable for other private equity firms to do it. We've invested in 3,000 megawatts of uh, generation capacity in Africa and have generated a very attractive return on that. So the story is compelling. The story is the, the investment uh, opportunity is very much there. Uh, the reality of the matter is that to be able to provide anywhere near the energy access that you alluded to, I think there needs to be a flow of capital into African uh, generation, into renewable energy at a completely different scale than what's happened before. Today, less than 20% of uh, climate change focused capital that is being invested across the world is coming into emerging markets ex China. Although 85% of the population is in emerging markets and 20% of the world's population is indeed in Africa. So I think that uh, uh, there will need to be a completely different approach to uh, catalyzing the investment opportunity in Africa. I think this will have to be private sector led, because today when we look at uh, government balance sheets across the continent, they are very much uh, uh, strained and there's a lot of fiscal challenges. So the capital needed to go into providing the investment into generation and uh, uh, transmission, distribution and transmission will inevitably have to come from the private sector players. Which then takes us to, you know, what needs to happen for that story to come to fruition. I think there's an enabling regulatory environment that has to uh, uh, be there. And I think there's been a lot of progress done on that front in terms of, you know, governments taking a step back and providing a lot more of the investment opportunity for the private sector. But there also needs to be a lot of support from uh, uh, multilateral institutions. Because the reality of the matter is bringing capital at scale into African renewables requires the private sector players to work hand in hand with DFIs and multilateralists to be able to provide the blended finance instruments, the uh, supportive uh, uh, credit enhancement instruments that are needed to make that investment opportunity as compelling as it should be. And I think the, as I said, there's, there's a lot of evidence to show that you can really do very well out of investing in uh, uh, renewable generation in Africa, but I think not enough of that has happened. And I think if we're looking at the next kind of decade, I think there will need to be a complete step change in the momentum of the capital flows into the continent. No, thank you uh, very much, Sharif. I, when you talk about it from that angle, one wonders, are you going to invest in all the renewable energy projects if the grid infrastructure is, is it a chicken and an egg situation? I think, I think both of, I think you cannot have generation without uh, transmission, mm -hmm. right? And I think one of the key challenges that we face in Africa is so far, renewables have provided a complementary role to thermal power. Where we need to get to is to make renewable power a credible source, a reliable source of base load power. And for that to happen, there needs to be a lot of investment into the grid, into, into storage technologies on the generation side, but also there needs to be a lot of gr grid stabilization uh, investments that happen to make the grids in Africa capable of dealing with the increased scale of the renewables that's coming into it. No, 
Good answer. Thank you very much. No project exists without project development taking place. I'm also quite glad that we're moving away from this phrase of project preparation, which is very sort of public sector minded to commercial <coughs> infrastructure project development, because ultimately we need to invest throughout the cycle to actually get the more competitive return. So if we can invest in the development phase as, as, as well as the overall project, I think that seems to be the model that we are gravitating towards. So Chris, let me come to you and ask um, you to respond to hopefully uh, what steps can be taken to speed up commercial project development and to grow the number of investment opportunities uh, so that private capital can, can, can participate. Um, and really, what can the public sector organizations do? There's a bit of a follow-up question here. Um, you know, with the multilateral banks and the donors uh, to better support the wider industry. And I think, again, this step change, this, this need for a different perspective on scale, in the natural habitat of investors, we, we, we always seem to presume that the only ones that can de-risk anything are the MDBs or the DFIs. Whereas if you look at the Multilateral Investment Guarantee Agency, which provides that form of de-risking in some respects, 66% of their balance sheets are from private investors. So as we broaden out our perspective and our minds, I think the ability to be able to look at a 150 trillion pool that if we restructure our model and, and seek to create an investable asset class, perhaps the universe will, will, will increase. But, I'm, but there are those two questions for you. Uh, thank you very much. There's, there's a lot in there. Um, so let me try and uh, tick off as many of them as possible. Um, a bit of context first. We, we're right at the start of this market. Um, I think the number that was used in the report, 12 billion, the, the, the transmission investment annually at the moment, that's completely funded by public sector resources at the moment. There isn't a market of private sector assets that an in institutional investor can go invest in, it, invest in at the moment. Um, and I don't think there's a risk problem in relation to them because the sort of structures that you can use to fund transmission um, are well used elsewhere in the world and in the African context they have the same, the same sort of protections that have enabled the power generation sector to be bankable and be an attractive asset class on the continent. Um, what we have is a project development problem um, and I think hence the question. Um, now there are um, a few reasons for that. Um, one is that um, when you do any type of project or investment for the first time, it's slow and it takes time. In some respect, I think there are parallels with where the power generation sector was in Africa 20 years ago. When people first started doing generation projects, there were, they were few and far between. And then what you get are reference projects that can be replicated and followed. And these pilot projects build government capacity. Um, and, uh, and, and, then, and, then, and then they can speed up. And that's part of what Gridworks is involved in doing at the moment. Um, Gridworks is developing and will invest into the first generation of transmission projects in Africa. We have five underway at the moment. Now, each of those projects is valuable in its own right. It builds critical infrastructure that will increase network access for people and improve the availability and quality of power uh, to, uh, to commercial customers, to industry as well. But they'll also serve as reference projects. We think they'll be the first... Um, IPTs, uh, first independent power transmission projects in their market, um, and, and we expect more to follow. Um, in terms of the role of the MDBs, historically the MDBs have provided um, uh, public sector backed loans to government for the transmission sector. That's that 12 billion uh, number. Now, you can't get from 12 to the 48 billion using MDB money. There isn't enough money available. So we have to leverage the private sector. Um, and, and at the moment, um, in order to do that, we have to speed up the project development challenge by um, upscaling the, the government resources that can be applied to a project. Transmission projects require a big interface with government. They need to be planned by a transmission service operator. They need to be implemented by a private developer working very, very closely with the utility to deal with interface risks. Um, this, this asset is networked. It's, it's, not, um, it's not as sort of discreet as a generation asset on the network. Um, so we need a real change in the scale of capacity that's available amongst governments to do this. The MDBs have started doing work in some markets. Um, uh, Uganda, um, South Africa themselves, are, I believe, are shortly going to announce that they plan to auction uh, three IPTs as part of a pilot. Um, but it's very hard to go from naught to 100 miles an hour and conduct a large-scale infrastructure tender. The resources that are required at government 
um, simply don't exist at the moment. You need to hugely increase um, the, 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 the government capacity to engage with, uh, with, with projects like this. And um, I think the reality is that it's probably more likely going to be the case that pilots trickle, trickle through on a bilateral uh, basis first before you can have these, these sponsored programmes rather than the way round that the MDBs are focusing on at the moment. Um, I think the other thing I'll just say about the role of the MDBs is a couple of other simple things they could do that could make a big difference to the market as well. Um, at the moment, uh, for transmission to be eligible for climate finance, there's a taxonomy that's applied to it that's actually it's part of the common principles, and it's largely based on the status of transmission networks in developed markets. Um, it looks at the grid before and after a particular transmission project and, and then assesses its, um, its impact in terms, of, uh, in terms of net zero targets. And this isn't really appropriate for Africa. There are 600 million people on the continent of Africa who don't have a grid connection. Um, and those people don't sit there not consuming energy. They use diesel gensets. They chop down trees for charcoal. They, they, they produce power in other ways that are carbon emitting. And not factoring those activities in place mean that lots of interesting projects in Africa that are climate friendly don't qualify for the MDB's taxonomy. So I think that's a practical step that can be looked at straight away. Um, I'll finish in a moment, but I'll, I'll just pick up one other point that, uh, that you, you mentioned in your question as well around risk. I don't think that there is a big risk problem in the transmission sector. That's not the reason why people aren't investing in transmission. Um, there are similar bankable structures, similar to the power generation sector, um, and, the, uh, and this is a lower risk asset class traditionally elsewhere in the world. The operating risks are lower. Um, there's two problems. One of them is the project development pro problem, which I just described. There simply aren't assets coming to market, and, and that will change over time through projects like the ones that we're working on. But the other project is a viability gap. Um, the other, sorry, the other problem is a viability gap problem, not a risk problem, whereby if you provide a $400 million project, they could look to spread that across eight or nine projects and provide smaller chunks of capital necessary to buy down the price of the infrastructure, concessionary capital, and then leverage private sector capital as well. And that's the only way that I can see um, the sector in Africa getting the funding it needs to meet the 2050 targets, let alone the 2030 universal access targets, which I think sadly are, are not achievable at this stage. Okay, so, so with your last model that you just <coughs> described, which is much more of a portfolio approach, are we going to accelerate the ability to be able to potentially meet the targets? I think it will provide a fighting chance of meeting the targets. I wouldn't talk in terms of acceleration. I'd talk about whether it's achievable at all, to be quite honest with you. Interesting. Well, if there's any way that we can achieve those targets, I suppose it's in this new era of digitization. So I'm going to come to you, uh, Greg, as our digitization uh, uh, person. And, and I think it, you know, we can never, you know, overstate the importance of optimization and digital technologies um, in infrastructure. Um, you know, so, so, so really just give us your view, please, about the important role of digitization, um, you know, in, in this type of infrastructure and how that could potentially and positively influence the investment uh, decision uh, making uh, process. And really, you know, we're talking about how do we engage consumers in this overall discussion. How do you think consumers can actively uh, support uh, the grid? Um, and, and what steps should be taken to advance this? Over to you. Yeah, great, thank you. And, and actually, I, I was really pleased when Sharif described moving to renewables as a form of firm power or replacement for baseload. Because fundamentally, uh, look, the grids of the world, the word transmission tells you everything you need to know. Uh, in the old days, um, grid, uh, uh, power generation was typically huge, uh, very concentrated uh, plants near coal fields or maybe nuclear power stations. And then you transmitted the power to the population centers. Uh, but renewables are naturally a decentralized resource. And they can be built everywhere. 
uh, they can be built much closer to demand. And the grid really moves from a model of uh, transmitting huge amounts of power long distances to balancing the demand and supply in any given location and then balancing between you know, kind of areas that have got uh, excess at any given moment in time and areas that have got a deficit at any given moment in time. Uh, and so uh, if we're going to be thinking like that, it's extremely helpful because we need less infrastructure. Less infrastructure means it's cheaper and quicker to build. It means that we, have, uh, we can concentrate the investment in the stuff that's really needed to make a difference today. Um, and, and a couple of interesting features, right? Africa is six time zones, right? So you can be balancing that solar resource, you know, um, as the day progresses, helping deliver firm power without fossil fuels. And uh, we can be building this from the top down and the bottom up at the same time, rapidly improving both the, um, uh, the, the efficiency of the investment decisions and people's lives as we go. We don't need to wait for all the infrastructure in place. And, and you know, uh, EJ mentioned that, you know, uh, Africa is the world leader in microgrids, mm -hmm. right? And, and you're literally going from, you know, no grid at all, a house with solar panels, to uh, a microgrid where that house is balanced with some others in the same situation and some local businesses. And then you start joining the, the, the communities. And so I think this top down, bottom up, seeing the grid as a balancing mechanism, but this is only possible if you've got the real time data on what is being consumed and generated throughout that system. And then are using that ideally to send price signals that ensure that electricity is flowing to the right place at the right time. Great. Great, great point. So I suppose I, I'm still hanging off of uh, Chris's news. He's, he's, he's flattened my spirit just a little bit, I have to say, because <laughs> I, I, I thought we've got you know, all of this great energy that's going to say, this is how we get to the target, or this is how the private sector can completely transform things. But of course, we have to be realistic. Yeah. But, 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 but uh, Greg, I'd like to get your mm. ideas, you know, leveraging digitization and all of these different other opportunities that you see in some of those <laughs> examples that you've just given. How can we accelerate the crowding in of the private yeah. capital aligned to the targets. Because we're here right now, it's a big stock take. Um, a lot of the governments are going to be saying to us, well, we're now wanting to work with you as the private sector. What are your great ideas? We have this target. Um, how are we going to exceed it? Let alone, are we even going to get there? Yeah, like, I mean, like, a quick thought on this, right? Yes. At the same time as we're trying to decarbonize uh, the supply of electricity, and by the way, to bring it to the 40 odd percent of households that don't have access to electricity today. Um, we're changing how we consume. Um, at the moment, I think it takes about three weeks to get uh, fossil fuels from ports to many major African cities. All right? Um, by the way, it takes two or three days in Europe. Um, as we move to electrification of, of transport, so you're able to take these decentralized, um, super cheap renewables and use them to uh, revolutionize not only the, the ways we use electricity today, but the ways we need to use it tomorrow. And you know, look, uh, how many people die every year in the world from local air pollution? I think it's 10 million people a year. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, that's from burning stuff. That's from what was described earlier as, you know, uh, chopping down trees, making charcoal and diesel gensets. So I think what we need to recognize as we're trying to crowd in more investment is the number of solutions we're bringing here. It's not just tackling climate change. It's also tackling social justice on a global scale, and critically, immediate health needs. Wonderful. Now, thank you very much. And obviously, digitization is, a, is the hot topic. Um, and I know that, uh, Nadia, this is something that I'd like you to also uh, touch on. You've got deep experience in this. Anything to add from what uh, Greg, Greg has shared there or you know, any bigger views or, mm. or alternative views? Yeah, I mean, digital absolutely serves. But before we get to that, I, I would like to paint a more broad sure. perspective, if you don't mind. First of all, it's great to be here. And this is such an interesting dialogue, right? Because, I mean, we have the ambition, of course, to secure energy access for all. That's number one, right? We, we know the context of today. We know we want to decarbonize, right? That's another. We know that we are moving into a more digitalized world where data centers are also uh, an important market that is emerging in Africa as well, and that also requires um, transmission products, right? 
Um, and uh, obviously, I work for, for Siemens Energy, and we, we are driving quite large-scale infrastructure projects in transmission, distribution, power generation, whether conventional or, uh, or wind. Uh, we're looking at a future perspective that is m going to be more hybrid solutions as well, especially, especially if we're talking about decentralized uh, solutions, right, where you're going to see a mix of PV and wind and battery storage. And that is also requiring a, a thought around what, how, how do we, what kind of transmission products need to serve this energy system, which is serving maybe a rural uh, community, right? Uh, from a from an infrastructure perspective, number one is you need a plan. If you don't have a plan, then it's a plan to fail, right? So I think the success factor is in still in governments outlining a plan that can still have a privatization element because you first need to decide as a country to which extent do I want my grid to serve my population, right? That, 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 that is an active decision. Where you need to look at where, where is my where are my urban centers that I I reach as many people as possible, and where do I say that from there on it stops and it needs to be rather microgrids, decentralized solutions where you have a an island mode type of a solution, and I think we need to do both, right? But we need a combination of support from government, right? Government need to make sure yeah. that we don't have any policy uncertainty because that limits attraction of investors, right? You, you want as low risk as possible. We need some su successful projects as well because I think some of the, maybe we'll get into this topic later, but some of the deterring factors uh, for investment is, of course, if you see that it's t it has taken more than a decade, <laughs> in some cases with some of these infrastructure projects, that, then that is a deterring factor. So that's why also we need to ac accelerate progress by showing we can implement. We don't just talk, we go from plan to implementation and we show that there is a market here, there is a stability in governance, we have policies that give the right incentives for investors, but also, I mean, I anticipate for Africa, right? Uh, to both serve its own energy needs and close the energy access gaps that we see, but also create a, a domestic, a regional market, sub-regional market, and cross-regional uh, market where we can really, out of Africa, supply green ele electricity or green molecules to uh, serve the decarbonization ambitions of Europe or of other um, uh, regions, right? So how to translate that market opportunity to real market that then drives industrialization, socioeconomic growth, builds out this resilient energy infrastructure that, that is sustainable, that is reliable, that is affordable. That, that's the challenge that we need to figure out, and it's not a one-way solution, it's not a private or a public, it's a combined effort, and it's very much also a case-by-case, case. We, we, we talk about Africa, we talk about uh, 52 countries, right, and every country has different opportunities based on its access, its renewable natural resources, some uh, countries obviously on the coastline have great, magnificent opportunities for wind, uh, for solar, and that, that Uh, and here, digitalization, digital solutions can, can make sure that we can actually manage that system, right? Where you have 
base load power generation in combination with more intermittent um, renewable resources. And Not that if. adds a complexity to the system. Yes. And I'm hoping, um, I'm going to call on Ije now to just give her reflections because we've been talking about her report just yep. to, and just to give her reflections. But while she's speaking, I'd like you all to be thinking about the solutions to some of those <laughs> points that Nadia has raised. Um, you know, again, from the uh, private sector standpoint, from the SMI standpoint, how do we think we can contribute towards this, maybe through some kind of working structure, um, it, you know, in collaboration with the COP28 presidency or in support of the COP28 presidency to say how can we essentially provide some key recommendations about how to mobilize private capital at scale for African grid infrastructure so that becomes the expectation and not the exception. I'm going to give you each 30 seconds and we're going to uh, uh, start with Greg after Ije has finished and we're going to bookend it with me. So over to you, Ije. Thanks. Uh, a little bit, bit of homework. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, what, what I've heard is actually um, quite inspiring, quite, quite interesting for my fellow panelists. Uh, we're well aware of the need for project development to really create bankable projects, even in transmission and distribution in the way that we have done so uh, in generation. Um, one of the, the comments that really resonated with me was actually Greg's comment, where he talked about you know, the, the, what we're calling the central grid has to change. We can't fund central grid transmission and distribution projects in the way that we've done so 100 years ago, right? Um, the, right now, with the advances in technology, we can bring generation closer to where it's needed. We can serve communities in a more cost-effective manner. Uh, historically, you know, we embarked on major grid extension projects in cases where it didn't make sense, it didn't make economic sense, and that required a significant amount of subsidy. Uh, in the countries that we're looking at in sub-Saharan Africa, they have very constrained balance sheets. We're not going to be able to get guarant government guarantees uh, to create bankable transactions, so we need to bring innovation <laughs> not just in technology, but also innovation in how we structure some of these transactions. And I'd like to talk a bit about um, the cases we're seeing in Nigeria. Uh, Nigeria, obviously, is a very challenging situation where you've got a privatization process with mixed reviews and utilities that are more or less bankrupt. Um, but there is significant demand when you've got a population of 200 million um, individuals and you've got installed capacity of 4,000 megawatts, so a very severe case of energy poverty. And as, as Greg mentioned, um, and, and Chris, as Chris mentioned as well, a lot of that need is being served by diesel generation. But what we're seeing, uh, uh, partnering with utilities in that country, is we can look at ways of franchising, certain sub-franchising, certain aspects of a utilities uh, franchise. We are seeing companies now uh, taking over fe entire feeders as a way of developing a bankable distribution, um, potential distribution investment. And we're seeing uh, project sizes of 80 megawatts, 100 megawatts across the country that is really driving investment into distribution in a way that we haven't seen before. And that is being done in partnership with both the um, utilities, the central grid utilities, and uh, decentralized developers. So I'm really inspired by what I've, what I've heard, and it's, it sort of um, you know, corroborates what we've seen uh, on the ground uh, in some of the countries in, in Africa. Fantastic. Well, I've just been told we're virtually up on time, so that 30 seconds has gone to 15 seconds. One very quick parting shot um, reference to you know, how we can make, be that difference. Yeah. Greg? Right. So uh, we can invest an awful lot by breaking it down into small chunks and create models that let us take uh, smaller risks but on a replicable basis. For example, we're just starting with our first investment in Sierra Leone, building uh, solar and wind and battery to meet the needs of one development. And we get the data and we scale up and we're able to replicate. And you can make a very big difference through a lot of small steps. Thank you very much. Nadia? I mean, we have to recognize that the cost of capital in Africa is two to three times higher <coughs> than in developed countries. And I think that is a topic we need to uh, address because that will also help resolve the, the fiscal uh, challenges and various debt restructuring uh, dialogues that are ongoing in many countries. Because 
uh, whether it's um, uh, sovereign guarantees or access to uh, ECA government supported um, uh, finance. I mean, uh, Nigeria, I'm also. Um, 20 seconds. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Nigeria, I would say that there's a government to government collaboration between G Germany and uh, Nigeria, which we are supporting mm -hmm. with the transmission project uh, P PPI, Presidential Power Initiative, which will drive this, will drive this topic. And that is. And I think there's the, the reality of the difference between the perception of risk versus the reality of risk mm -hmm. in Africa. And I think if you look at uh, political risk insurance products and, you know, MEGA, for example, um, how many claims have been made because of breach of contract under MEGA policy in Africa? The answer is very, very few. Okay. So it's all about changing the perception of the risk in Africa. Francesco. Chris? Thank you. Um, I agree with Omar. I don't think there is a risk problem. I think there's a perception problem. But I think the biggest change we can make is by focusing on the biggest bottleneck, which is project development. There's two sides of that. We need more funding for developers, more people prepared to, to take the early stage development risk um, rather than the, the investment risk um, after financial close. And I think there's a big role to play on the public sector side as well uh, for MDVs and government in terms of increasing capacity with local governments because you have to have government counterparties to large-scale infrastructure projects. And that's a massive bottleneck at the moment. It's not something the private sector can fix itself. Final word, AJ? No, I think this is, I want to thank all of the panelists for spending time <clears throat> and helping us launch this important report that we think presents um, an, op um, an opportunity for investments in the grid infrastructure in sub-Saharan Africa. Thank you. Uh, please join me in thanking a panel for that excellent uh, interaction. <laughs> and thank you for being such a great audience. The session is closed. Doing business in Africa. You can't afford to be without Africa Investor.